Father, as we come and look at your word now, uh, we ask that you will be with us and help us to understand this portion of Mark and uh, remind us again of, this, of the splendor and the wonder and the sacrifice of the cross. Amen. Well, the phrase poison chalice uh, is originally found in Shakespeare's Macbeth in a speech where Macbeth flinches at the prospect of murdering Duncan. But here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here, that we but teach bloody instructions, which being taught return to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice. Now, I can confidently say, after having read Shakespeare, that New Testament Greek is a piece of cake. I've heard that Shakespeare sounds better in the Klingon language, at least according to the Klingon Chancellor Gorkon, who thinks so in Star Trek VI. I think I'm the only one in the room that ever watches Star Trek. But it is, um, the, the Klingon Chancellor is played by Christopher Plummer. So I imagine if you like Sound of Music, well, in inevitably that spills over into Star Trek. Let me translate this Shakespearean sentence into modern-sounding English. But for the crimes like these, there are still punishments in this world. By committing violent crimes, we only teach other people to commit violence. And the violence of our students will come back to plague us teachers. Justice, being equal to everyone, forces us to drink from the poison cup that we serve to others. To drink the poison cup is to receive something that may at first sound very good, but in fact it does great harm to the person who receives it. And as we continue to think and work through the Gospel of Mark, we see that Mark uh, doesn't serve up a, a poison cup. In fact, he never gives us facts and doctrine and teaching without at first pressing home the, uh, the practical and the pastoral implications. Mark's thinking is earthy and raw and as he uncovers the splendor of the cross he calls us to pick up our crosses and walk a path through this broken world and what awaits us at the end of that journey is the kingdom in all its glory. In our passage today Mark brings our attention to the image of the cup and baptism pictures uh, that are designed to play upon our imaginations, drinking the cup and being washed in baptism, the cup of God's wrath and the baptism of his death, that the Son of Man came to serve by drinking the cup and by enduring the baptism of death. And we share in the cup and baptism because Jesus stood in our place. And so as Jesus served us in this quite remarkable way, so we too are called to serve one another. So I hope you have your Bibles open uh, still to Mark 10, 35 to 45, for this is our text. Uh, Jesus has again spoken of his passion uh, in verse 34, you know, one of three passion predictions, and this is the third one. And in verse 34, Jesus says to his followers, that they will condemn him to death, hand him over, mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. But these words just pass over James and John, who sidestep the suffering and head straight for the glory. Fancy that. Teacher, they say, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. But Jesus responds not harshly. He responds in the language of the servant. He replies, what do you want me to do for you? And with great humility, <laughs> not, James and John say, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. They don't want much, do they? And this leads Jesus to reply, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? 
And surprisingly, the disciples, James, well, James and John, come back and say, yes, we can, but with this privilege comes a new way of living, a life of servanthood, because this is life in the kingdom. Uh, how can they say, yes, what's going on here? Uh, so let's spend a few moments just un unpacking this and looking at these images of the cup and baptism. The cup of God's anger is meant to prod your imagination. And there's a slide that helps. The imagine, oh, sorry, the image, the image of, of, of the cup of God's anger, it's supposed to feel disturbing. It's supposed to be provoking. It's meant to be intense. It's to be avoided at all costs. And the reason the image is disturbing and provoking and intense and to be avoided at all costs is because God's anger is disturbing and provoking and intense and to be avoided at all costs. What more lethal drink could any cup contain than the fury of God's wrath? Throughout the course of history, Israel assumed the nations were the only ones uh, deserving of this cup of God's anger. The nations around Israel. This cup was for the Gentile nations, and indeed it was, as expressed by prophets like Isaiah. And you'll see prophets uh, and Jeremiah's words there on the screen. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. And when they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because of the sword I will send among them. So I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom he sent me drink it. The nations, deserving of God's anger, then again, Psalm 75, 8. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. Draining the cup dispenses the full measure of God's anger. God's wrath against the Babylonian nation, Habakkuk, 2.16, you will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it's your turn. Drink and be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming round to you and disgrace will cover your glory. The wrath of God against the wickedness of the nations. But wickedness is wickedness and there are no privileged positions. Sin is rebellion and God's uh, position is is always a consistent one. And so Israel's prophets use the image of the cup being passed to Israel too. Ezekiel 23. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. You will drink your sister's cup, a cup large and deep. It will bring scorn and derision, for it holds so much. You will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, the cup of ruin and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria. You will drink it and drain it dry. You will dash it to pieces and tear your breasts. I have spoken, declares the Sovereign Lord. Friends, there is no one who can excuse themselves from God's anger. The Old Testament, as it closes, leaves us with a very clear picture. Humanity is in a frightfully bad situation. And unless God extends his mercy, each of us will experience the full fury of God's anger. Paul captures the mood in the New Testament. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us deserve to drink from the cup. But the Lord himself has chosen to drink for us. By his wounds we are healed. God in his mercy chooses to drink the cup that God, that, that God would rightly give to us. The Father passes the cup to Jesus, who drinks from this cup until the cup is empty. The servant of the Lord suffered until death 
in order to make the many righteous by his wounds. As Jesus drinks from that cup, we are healed. So Jesus says to James and John, you'll see it there in Mark 38, can you drink the cup I drink? Or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? The cup and the baptism. The cup of God's anger violently consumed. Oh, I've never seen a violent baptism, have you? Uh, not even a cranky parrot or, or, a, or a baby dropped or uh, I've seen adults pushed into the baptismal waters but they've always resurfaced looking quite well and, and able to carry on and live another day. I've, I've seen violent babies you know, as they pee on the minister's arm as he tries to... Uh. In what sense is the cross his baptism? The verb is used to describe a person drowning or the sinking of a ship or by being overwhelmed by floodwaters. So... Uh, with that meaning, uh, the image came to be used metaphorically, like I'm drowning in a sea of troubles or, or the floodwaters of life are just swirling around me. In Psalm 69, the psalmist uses the image of baptism for the overwhelming troubles that he is facing, the overwhelming floodwaters describing his dying, the grave, and the wrath of God poured out upon him, so the psalmist is, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. Deliver me from the sinking mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. wonder if you've ever thought that way. Here the psalmist is suffering at the hands of his enemies. Already he has endured their mockery, their insults, their scorn. And to make it worse, he, he is suffering here because he is zealous for the things of the Lord, for the things of God. But it's gone one step further. Now he is in fear of his life. The baptism he describes is the pit which is the image for the grave. In this Passion Psalm, the Messiah is dreading the baptism of imminent death in which God will turn his face away. And God will remain far away until God alone decides to redeem and to save. So it's rather underwhelming to say that at the cross, Jesus is overwhelmed by a flood of troubles. No man has ever been troubled so much. His baptism is his death. This was the moment when God turned his face away and the son was left distant from the father. God separated from God for the first time in eternity and fellowship only restored when the father chooses to come and redeem and to save. And so this image of the cup and this picture of baptism are loaded with Old Testament thought which provocably describe the horror of the cross. Oh, men may mock and spit and flog and kill, but it is God who will give his son the cup of his anger and prompt the baptism of his death. Isaiah says it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. He had no beauty or, or majesty to attract us to him. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. There is no one else like Jesus. And so the implied answer to the question in verse 38, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? Well, the implied answer must be no. But James and John respond, we can a naive answer from the disciples. But here's the surprise. Did you notice as it was read for us? Jesus says to them, you will drink the cup I drink. 
and you will be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with. What does it mean then when Jesus assures the disciples that they will drink his cup and be baptised with his baptism? Well, Psalm 69 again provides some answers. For the, although it is the King, the Messiah, suffering in this psalm, his rescue is essential for the salvation of others. The King and his people are connected. The fate of the King determines the future of his people. And so Jesus died for the many. He drank the cup for others. Our future is vested in his future. And so Jesus was baptised on our behalf. It's as though James and John, along with the many, drank the cup that he drank and were baptised with the baptism that Jesus experienced. Jesus bore God's anger as our substitute. He cancels the curse for us. So we do not need to suffer. When we are in Christ, by faith in him, we die with him, united to him, and we raise, we are risen from the dead, belonging to him. By proxy, we participate in the death of Jesus and his victory over the grave. The one at the top of the heap went to the bottom of the heap so that we at the bottom could rise to the top of the heap. Sam Chan has his great illustration. Uh, during the COVID isolation, the Queen's Gambit was the number one show watched on Netflix in 63 countries. You may have even been someone who watched it. And due to the show's success, people got back into chess. Um, uh, soon, chess sets became as hard to find to buy in the shops as was toilet paper <laughs> during the pandemic. And the, the Queen's Gambit is a fictional story about Beth Harmon, a brilliant young chess player. And Beth um, begins her life in an orphanage. She has no friends, but she's adopted by a stepmother who drinks too much and a stepfather who's ugly and, and, and never welcomes her. But the thing going for Beth is that, that she's so brilliantly good at chess. She can play the game in her head. She pitches the pieces, the chessboard, uh, on the bathroom ceiling as she lies there taking a bath. And her little green tranquilizer pills also help. She takes on the stuffy, male-dominated, traditional world of chess and beats those male competitors convincingly. In some ways, it's a typical bottom of the heap to the top of the heap sporting success story. It's sort of like the Rocky of chess movies. It's Netflix giving us, you know, that you can be the anything you want to be story. Don't listen to others. In the end, you've just got to believe in yourself and you'll get there. But of course it helps that Beth is drop-dead gorgeous. She has impossibly smooth white skin with mesmerising doll-like eyes. She turns heads. Her, all her male friends fall for her. And this is where Netflix gives with the one hand, oh, you can be anything you want to be, but then, it, then they take with the other, oh, but you also need to be uh, gifted and, and gorgeous and uh, a drop-dead beauty and victorious. In contrast, Jesus is the one who gives with both hands literally, outstretched on a cross. Jesus at the bottom of the heap places, uh, swaps places with us at the bottom of the heap. He takes away our brokenness, our shame, our loneliness, and he gives us his glory, his, his status, and he gives us his victory. Jesus does this not with a queen's gambit, but with a king's gambit. James and John, along with the many, drank the cup that Jesus drank and were baptised with the baptism that he was baptised with. To use Paul's language, they died and they rose with Christ because his death was in their place and on their behalf. His resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus, was their resurrection. What a privilege it is, friends, we have to participate in the life of Christ. It therefore makes sense that we live in the shadow of the cross and in the light of the resurrection. 
live between the empty cross and the empty grave. How do we do this? Well, after explaining his own servanthood, Jesus pulls the disciples aside and says to them, verse 42, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, mozzie boots, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The one at the top of the heap went to the bottom of the heap, so that we at the bottom of the heap could rise to be at the top of the heap. For the sake of the Lord and his gospel, we therefore must live as servants, putting ourselves last. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And in the end, you know, James and John paid enormous prices for their faith in Jesus. James was martyred early and John was exiled to the island of Patmos where he saw visions of of what lay ahead for the church and we have them in the book of Revelation. James and John each gave his life in different ways to follow the Lord who saw greatness in sacrifice and not in human success that we might have the courage to do as those men did, faithfully serving the Lord, no matter what challenges face us in our lives. May God empower us and embolden us to live our lives in obedience to him. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you that with these images of uh, the cup and baptism, we, uh, we understand further what it means for your son to die on our behalf. And we thank you that he did that. We thank you that he emptied the cup of your anger for us. And that the baptism of his death, he died for us. And so in some sense, we too were there drinking that cup and and. It, experiencing that baptism our only response can be to pick up our cross to follow Jesus to live fully for him through whatever this world might throw at us to remain faithful and focused for the way to glory is the path of suffering Father, renew us, renew our spirit. Give us the courage to do those things that that we should be doing but we don't do. Help us to overcome our personal frailties and inhibitions. Send us your spirit to strengthen us, to empower us, to embolden us. For what else can we do For you alone have the words of eternal life. Amen.